Well, uh, good morning, uh, everyone who's joined us and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar about uh, digital transformation in the COVID-19 recovery phase. Uh, my name is Jack Adams. I am the business development manager at the London Economic Development Corporation, focusing in the manufacturing sector and uh, also food processors. Uh, please note that this session is being recorded and will be published to the LEDC's YouTube page following the webinar, which you will receive in a follow-up email from LEDC tomorrow. Everyone except our panelists are muted during the webinar, but we invite you to submit your questions for our speakers using the Q&A function here in Zoom, uh, and we'll get through as many as we can today in the time allotted. On the agenda, we will hear from uh, Steve Karpenko, C Senior Business Advisor at the Ministry of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, followed by a brief Q&A session moderated by my colleague, Raphael Vargas, Senior Export Advisor with the Ministry of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Then we will hear from Mark Corker, Executive Director at MTech Hub and, and additional Q&A. And then you'll hear from Jason Bates, Senior Advisor at the Excellence in Manufacturing Consortium and Chair of the London Region Manufacturing Council, before finally we wrap things up around 11.30. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Stephen to kick things off. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thanks for everybody for joining us. Thanks, Jack. So I'll just flip over to... Uh, the beginning here and welcome everyone um, so I'm just going to basically my role in the Ministry of Economic Development job creation and trade right now working really hard uh, within the COVID-19 kind of uh, disaster slash recovery phase on, on various funding programs and uh, just helping companies manage through uh, from a more of a general management standpoint but my day job if you want to call it that is to uh, help companies with uh, technology transformation, tech adoption, uh, sp specifically in the manufacturing sector, and more specifically in the uh, automotive sector within manufacturing. So um, I'll just share some information of what I have uh, come across, where I think things are going from uh, here out, and then I'll pass it on to my colleague, Mark Corker, and he'll go into a little more detail in terms of practical things that uh, we can do right now to kind of get on that tech adoption on-ramp for manufacturers. Just referencing some studies that have been done, uh, this is a little bit dated in the sense that it came out in October 2018, but we were seeing the, uh, the trend of and the connection between digital maturity and business performance. Uh, part of that was tied to productivity. We now uh, know that in hindsight, the productivity gap started to widen with the U.S. again around 2017, 2018, we were more or less uh, close to parity around 2015. And so businesses with low digital maturity, it's not so much the, the number uh, that there is a correlation between uh, tech adoption and, and revenue uh, performance. I mean, what company hasn't seen their sales plummet in the last three months, let alone three years? So uh, that figure is a lot less relevant to, uh, today, but the, the point is made. Uh, another thing that the research is pointing to uh, is are the uh, obvious uh, things in terms of productivity boost, uh, operating cost reduction, and uh, to a lesser extent, uh, overall product quality improvements. And these are pretty big numbers uh, in terms of uh, companies' experiences and, and the real benefits. Again, it's not so much the, the, the number itself or the precision of that number, just that uh, tech adoption really does have a very strong business case underneath it. And, Every manufacturer, of course, has adopted technology to one extent or another, but uh, this part of the, the IT sector is moving as rapidly as the rest of them. And uh, with the, when you think of uh, IoT, Internet of Things, the explosion of data on the shop floor, the, the question is how do our systems kind of uh, grapple with that and then translate into something meaningful that can be used uh, in real time in terms of decision making, whether that's through a a manual interface or an automated interface, uh, the, the reality is if we can do a good job of that, there are dollars on the table. And a big part of that is developing the business case going forward in terms of pointing the direction in terms of what technology and what the priorities are and, and even what the budget is. Uh, here's another a data point that's important. Uh, I've spoken to it already, which is the, the productivity gap. Uh, here, Ontario is over there on the, the far right in, in purple, and uh, the rest of the, the bars are states uh, or provinces in Canada. And you can see the increments aren't huge, and the average is 
pretty much the United States average in the middle of the chart. And if you were to compare Ontario versus the US, the US would be performing at about 25% higher productivity. Now, I understand it's difficult to say, well, gross domestic product per capita in a primarily service economy, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to kind of put that in terms of productivity figures. But just again, as a general uh, indicator, that uh, that things aren't always stable and that we can't just assume that work, work, what worked yesterday is going to work for us tomorrow and that closing those productivity gaps, especially as we recover from the COVID-19 with all the supply chain disruption we've seen, that taking advantage of opportunities, uh, it, it won't just be status quo. There's great opportunity out there, but that of course requires uh, some, some pivots in terms of business models and markets but also uh, internally in terms of investment strategies and uh, seeing that if, if that's something that needs to be jumped on right away or can be maybe delayed uh, while focusing on other priorities. But now is a great time to invest. Uh, the, the implication is clear. So these statements, again, uh, pre-COVID-19, but the reality is there's, there's this large company, small company dynamic and uh, larger companies are at risk in the sense that uh, more nimble competitors do emerge especially now we're seeing um, look at Boeing and, and that was um, pre uh, current situation where they have run into all kinds of trouble related to their product and that uh, has, has changed where they're sitting in terms of their business performance and really put the company at risk and now other competitors have a chance to uh, take advantage of that. Uh, we're seeing large companies like Hertz, uh, JCPenney, uh, run into trouble as a result of the, the COVID-19 situation and uh, also uh, what, what supply sector isn't being disrupted, whether it's energy, communications, tourism, retail, food. And the, the thing there is that where there is supply chain disruption, there's opportunity. And so whether you're either you're a direct supplier or you might be a supplier to uh, a, a key player in these sectors that uh, for you to look for the opportunity, but in order for smaller companies, coming to the second point, in order for smaller companies to take advantage, uh, they too need to do something in terms of investment and in terms of getting on top of uh, technology shortfalls or taking advantage of uh, uh, interfaces that are provided by this technology, to maybe play a bigger game and uh, do business to business uh, transaction with larger players and then use technology also as a platform to scale up and uh, that those, those are, are very specific things, uh, whether it's the, uh, the, the B2B elements of it or the ability to scale up that require a very specific investments in technology. Uh, so coming back, why technology adoption, cost reductions, uh, customer satisfaction levels are improved by uh, better order fulfillment, whether it's related to time or related to product quality, or related to handling of, of returns and order changes. There's a big customer satisfaction element there that can be dealt with. Uh, and then skills retention. And so we're seeing that people who are coming out of school with uh, skills and, and there are definitely skill shortages in a lot of the manufacturing, uh, parts of the manufacturing sector, that they are preferring to go to companies that have that kind of technology that are kind of playing in that game where uh, they feel they can really apply what they've learned and uh, pretty much fit themselves career-wise uh, with a company that is, is going places or that they can maximize their next stage of learning as part of their career development. So skills retention is also a factor. Um, the chart below, it, it shows that uh, we're, we're kind of, you know, in terms of companies that have ERPs and have systems that they're finding that, um, you know, it's not really facilitating where they want to go. And so these companies, and, and we know we're not in ERP 1.0 anymore, or even 2.0. We know that uh, we need to go back and, and revisit those, uh, those investments in, in prior systems, maybe upgrade, further retire spreadsheets uh, as decision systems and uh, get in. And, and then as we start to onboard some of the stuff Mark will be talking about in terms of IoT and big data, then integrating all that going forward also requires a, a further revisit of system strategy and investment. So the, the key challenges uh, that we're seeing, uh, selecting and implementing the right systems. I, I think that's been number one for as long as uh, I've been involved in the industry and that's uh, 20 plus years. 
Uh, cost of purchasing software and equipment is definitely a factor. Uh, and then designing uh, new processes and training staff kind of comes in, uh, two and three are, are pretty close. Uh, disruption to ongoing operations, uh, that is always the case with, with new systems uh, in, in that uh, if, you if you're talking about information systems and running in parallel in order to ensure data integrity, or if you're talking about robotics and uh, line automation where uh, there's disruption, especially if you're a single line manufacturer, it, it can be significant. So uh, although that's down at number four for depending on what uh, stage you're in, uh, that could very much be number one in terms of uh, disruption. So we really need to, when we're adopting technology, balance these four factors. And that, that comes out in the selection process, which we'll talk about later. So just uh, taking a bit of a snapshot as to where we are, uh, we've come a long way in terms of systems. When you think of uh, Industry 1.0 as it relates to uh, technology, where uh, everything was kind of standalone and uh, computers are really defined by uh, accounting systems. Uh, industry industry 2.0 as it relates to systems was more driven by uh, data and data integration and the ability to collect data and pass it through to, again, primarily financial systems. And then we had standalone planning systems. But now we're, we're coming out of uh, industry 3.0 into industry 4.0. And 3.0 is really defined by some really solid systems in different areas. So you think of the top left, you have uh, your, your financial mechanisms, and that really feeds into production planning, knowing what your, your production costs are, um, scheduling, uh, knowing how much time is required to produce an order of a certain size, really uh, good results in that area. Uh, then at the bottom, we have uh, warehouse management, shipping, invoicing, uh, transportation, those are all really solid as well, and they may or may not be part of the ERP, but uh, we, we do have some uh, really good uh, systems there. And a lot of this stuff now, of course, has moved to the cloud and, and the vendors uh, during this uh, Industry 3.0 period. They uh, spend time uh, coming kind of down market to be able to serve smaller companies. And, you know, in the early days, it was just SAP, and these were huge implementations. But now with the cloud and with uh, smaller implementations, the ability for uh, SMEs and, and smaller manufacturers to adopt these systems. But then on the, on the right-hand side of this chart, you, you see the production management capability, what we call operational technology, and how uh, it's, it's, it's really kind of not standalone per se, and that there is some uh, automated uh, data transfer and, and updating back into the, to the planning systems. But when you think of the day-to-day uh, -day operations that, that really it, it's kind of contained within the plant, uh, within the personnel, the supervisory functions, the uh, reading of displays uh, on equipment, the, the output, um, assessing product quality. Uh, that's all this, the product management function. And that really brings us into uh, industry 4.0. And with this chart, what we see is um, the, the colored boxes where we have the uh, manufacturing execution system coming in and, and kind of becoming the middleware between the, uh, the production function and the planning function so that uh, we, we get more um, uh, accuracy in terms of when an order is committed to for a customer that in, in fact we're able to uh, deliver that and take into account uh, maintenance and downtime that's happening on the line or maybe a variation in setup costs and that's really the next um, stage in terms of when we talk about cost reductions related to uh, ERPs and, and shop floor systems is to, uh, once we've kind of squeezed out everything in terms of leaning operations and, and waste control and uh, operational efficiency, minimization of movement, et cetera, we, we now have this thing left, which is really around production optimization. And the next wave of systems coming in, and when you look at the, the red circle in the middle, it's kind of the, the unifying factor or the, the theoretical uh, unifying uh, namespace, whether it's in the cloud or uh, within the facility, but it's really uh, the, the way for the translation mechanism. So the production planning systems and, and the production um, uh, operational technology can, can communicate in real time uh, and then connect to, you see the cloud there being introduced where uh, we have a lot more sophisticated cloud now than just the, the vendor uh, ERP systems where we can plug into functions. Uh, the cloud is now playing a role, whether it's through uh, AWS by Amazon or Azure, where we're, we're having a sharing of IP 
and, and learning and machine learning happening in the cloud, which is able to feed back into these systems and uh, through optimization algorithms and, and learning and predictive algorithms, I think we're gonna, very, we're gonna see a very quick um, ramp up of the sophistication here. And a key part of that, of course, is data security and operational security. But once that gets kind of smoothed out, and we've seen it before where we'll, we'll now be able to really ramp up in terms of the data and, and with the, the super smart cloud uh, capabilities that we have uh, to plug that data into operational capabilities, which uh, will give us that sophistication. So that's really where uh, things are going. And it's a pretty exciting time for everyone and, and maybe for those who've been delaying investments um, in their ERP or in ERP upgrades, there'd be a chance to uh, look at, at things on, on a broader basis and include some of uh, these optimization and production integration capabilities into your user requirements when communicating with vendors. Because as we know, there are a lot of vendors out there and they, they're kind of operating at different speeds. Generally speaking, they're in the ERP game or in the operational technology game. But practic in practical reality, uh, some of the MES functionality that you might see in a separate system like Factory Logic is being built into the ERPs and, and vice versa. So it, it's not, the boundaries aren't cut and dried and, and kind of navigating through those gray areas is part of the selection and investment process. So what defines the digital factory? Uh, no more paper, I mean, I don't know, no more paper, we've been saying that for a long time, but certainly connected applications, uh, real-time metrics where we can, uh, as the, the speed of the supply chain, uh, that the, the quality of the data, the quality of the processing is keeping up and that we're making decisions that actually we can uh, fulfill on the order uh, end of it uh, through data analytics, both predictive machine learning uh, and, and also uh, the, the cloud-based uh, stuff that I talked about, but uh, also dashboards, uh, C-suite suite type stuff like um, how, how, what are our margins looking like uh, as we uh, shift and as supply chain shift. Um, our sales numbers, our sales pipelines, and different productivity metrics. So using analytics, uh, not just uh, feeding kind of real-time uh, systems and, and operational uh, decisions, but also using analytics as business planning and strategic tools. So just um, the, the factory of the future uh, using this. Uh, so different projects at hand that you can tap into. Uh, the stars, you can see the stars in each box, three stars representing something that's kind of uh, here today that we can uh, get at right now. Uh, two stars may be a uh, something that the tech your technology is here today, maybe you're not ready for it yet. And then one star are things where uh, the tech is around, but uh, probably out of reach for a lot of smaller manufacturers. So uh, the initial things are, are sensors that lead to uh, operational savings and, and some predictive capability. Uh, with two stars, we, we have more um, uh, eliminating waste uh, in, in inventory through uh, maybe uh, predictive capabilities or, or better tracking through technology like RFID, uh, reducing maintenance downtime, and then a little further down the road, uh, laser-based inspection, so automated inspection. Those, those machines and, and tools exist today, but uh, they're, they're fairly specialized. Uh, and then autonomous material handling where a product is moving around more or less uh, without human intervention a little further down the road. So I hope I've linked together and, and made a case for the fact that uh, in my uh, observation, the, the different layers of the, uh, of the integration are, are there in our systems and, and available uh, for you as manufacturers to make the investment. Uh, whereas before we were really focused on kind of the, the different um, areas whether it was the uh, information technology or the operational and, and kind of leaning the operation and, and really addressing shop floor issues almost uh, separately from business planning. But now the uh, integration of those worlds is, is something we see through this um, kind of managerial view where you have field and operations and control uh, linking through supervision uh, into management layers and then enterprise, enterprise planning. And, uh, a little more pyramid power that uh, digital strategy is uh, is business strategy, and I guess this uh, this has been around a long time. But I would say, in my opinion, that we're we're as close now as we've ever been, and hopefully our manufacturers uh, in London can take advantage of once we we kind of navigate through the the crisis and reopen. 
that as your businesses recover, that you're able to take advantage of some of the opportunities and uh, have time that you can plan and work with vendors and, and integrate those opportunities or business opportunities with uh, your technology investments uh, going forward and start to realize that industry 4.0 promise. So uh, that's it uh, for me. Thank you, Stephen, uh, for their very informative presentation. Uh, let's dive into some questions uh, that we received here. Um, first one will be, how will you align and prepare and sustain employees or engagement through uh, digital transformation? I, I think that's an awesome question. And um, it, it's one where you have a, an op I, to me, the engagement starts right at the very beginning. And in order to uh, make an investment, whether you're, regardless of where you are on that, that spectrum of maturity, and uh, maybe you're, you're in a 3.0 looking to, to upgrade or add features, uh, is that there's a business case behind that. And all these things cost money. And they, they, uh, the, the hard cost of what you're spending with the vendor might only represent 25 or 30 percent of the of the overall cost, and you factor in kind of the soft cost, the disruption that we talked about. Uh, so I would say that if the uh, the change management and the involvement of, of people in that change cycle, it starts right at the beginning with the business case, and some of those more critical disruptive things will come out right off the top, which is. Did you think about and how we considered this and, and uh, getting those on the table right away? And then the next stage is when you're starting to define your requirements uh, at that phase that you're able to, uh, again, involve those same people or expand the group. However, uh, your, your company operates in terms of internal communications and organization. But as you start to build the requirements that ultimately will be shared with vendors, that again, you're involving uh, people, you're involving the, the key personnel, the key job functions, because uh, literally um, everyone is impacted by even now the, uh, the smallest change or upgrade. Uh, there, there's training as a minimum. Uh, there, there might be a disruption in terms of downtime, whether it's in the office or on the shop floor. So involving them in, in uh, the vendor requirements and then uh, maybe to a, a lesser extent to fewer people, but uh, th that then gets passed on to the vendor in terms of their response to the, to the request that you make uh, as a customer. Uh, and that, that to me is where the, the cycle um, kind of starts in earnest. The vendor takes over a little bit in terms of providing guidance, leadership, project management, which you complement. But uh, coming back, uh, to me, it starts right at the, the business case uh, development. Okay, okay, great. Um... How can suppliers of digital technologies share information uh, with manufacturers looking to adopt technology? Uh, for example, like you mentioned, the platforms, uh, different websites, uh, contacts. Well, I'm sure uh, Jack would agree. There, there's just so much, there's too much information out there. Um, like, the, I, don't, I don't know of any one portal but my process always starts with with research uh, secondary i call it secondary research which is web-based if i don't have a vendor relationship already uh, there, there's just uh, gartner group does a great job through their magic quadrant analysis in terms of not just the uh, overall uh, erp but then the sector by sector uh, erp i think working with your your economic uh, councils uh, whether it's lebc or um, uh, industry consortiums is a great place because sometimes just everyone sourcing those uh, a Gartner report individually is really not economical because they're, they're not free. But um, there's certainly a, a lot of white papers and, and just by doing your research kind of almost like within a week you can uh, really come up to speed in terms of uh, where the, the hot buttons are. Uh, and then if you have existing systems uh, working with your, your vendor to see how they respond and then uh, if you're open or planning a more a broad ERP and, and a, a more kind of radical um, implementation that uh, to contact the vendors and uh, eventually whittle it down. But, uh, so the, the direct answer is I don't know of any one portal because there is no one single source of information, but there is a lot, if not too much information in general. Great. Thanks. Um, what other assistance could be or is, um, would be required for businesses to move forward with uh, tech adoption? Um, well, we as a, as, a, as a government agency, we don't, or a government ministry, we don't provide uh, direct advisory services, but certainly out there uh, in, the, in the marketplace, whether it's uh, 
And again, I, I would come back to your primary point of contact or, or your local uh, industry groups and your associations and, and your local community support. That, that's a great place to start because you, you don't necessarily have to pay top dollar for everything and, and good advice doesn't always cost an arm and a leg. But um, there are organizations out there, the Business Development Bank of Canada certainly has a, an advisory practice where uh, they uh, like to position themselves as, as being sort of a uh, an, an, an unbiased player uh, trying to, to uh, extract the most value from the process on behalf of their clients. Uh, BDO has a practice, um, Deloitte, there, there are a number out there, but again, I would start with, um, with your, your local community and, uh, and your peer group to find out what those experiences have been before moving forward with, uh, with vendors. Okay, uh, we got two more, I think. Uh, what will be the, you mentioned in your presentation, the implementation software and the process to implement uh, tech adoption or implement technology. And uh, one of the key points that you mentioned is uh, the cost uh, design and the disruption that these uh, may cost. What will be some of, uh, of uh, taking your expertise, uh, the easiest way to implement or, or to minimize this all this with disruption with the, in the process of implementation? Well, the easiest way is just to go ahead and do it. And that's also the most, <laughs> that's also the most painful way. Uh, I, I, I was, uh, for a long time, I was in the BDC's uh, Business Development Bank of Canada's advisory practice in specifically in the ERP on a national basis. So I traveled the country and meet with companies and talk to them about their uh, challenges with, um, with their ERP systems, their information technology, not so much uh, operational shop floor stuff because we, we weren't quite there uh, as far as the ERPs go, but um, you wouldn't believe how many, I, I would say a, a solid half of implementations, uh, there was a level of dissatisfaction. A quarter of them were almost like, we, got, we have to throw this thing out. It's just not working for us. That we're not getting any of the benefits we planned. So uh, those were all the result of, of not taking time up front and in, in, in the business of, of technology implementation, I think we would all agree now that uh, time invested up front, whether it's in requirements definition, business case development, pays off in spades, because you then move through design if there's customization require, um, required that, that has a cost to it that as you go through that front end, it really pays off in the back end. And, and as I said earlier, that, first implementation and the cost of that is only the tip of the iceberg in terms of overall, because you have to live with these systems for not just one or two years, but once you get through with this, uh, this whole process, you're talking of maybe a 10 year cycle where um, mistakes really get magnified. And, uh, so that would be my, my advice in that area. Well, Stephen, thank you very much uh, you. for your time. And um, I hand it off to Mark for the next presentation. Thanks everyone. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Steve and, and Raphael, and, and thanks to LADC and the participants uh, that have joined us. So let me just fire up my screen here. Can everyone see my screen okay? Any, okay, we're looking good. All right. Uh, so today I just want to talk uh, some, some specific things of how you can use IoT to improve productivity. Um, so my name is Mark Corker. I've got 30 years in technology and manufacturing. I'm currently executive director of MTech Hub, which is a nonprofit association of manufacturing companies focused on digital transformation. And we stake the claim to we're the first industry 4.0 innovation center in, in North America. So this has changed, but from 2018, top business challenges for SMEs from uh, Canadian manufacturing exporters. And these show up on every survey. So skilled labor, cost of labor, increasing competition, taxes and, and technology adoption. Um, recently, of course, we've got a new, new wrench thrown into the mix. Uh, so this, Economic activity is really tanked recently due to the due to the shutdown, but I would echo Steve's 
advice is now is actually a great time to be working on process improvement and digital adoption. If you're seeing any air pockets in your business, it's, it's a great time to invest and organize this and prepare yourself when the economic cycle recovers. Like other members of the panel, I'm into a lot of manufacturing. It's a rare week when I'm not in two or three small and mid-sized manufacturing. And, you know, you start to see patterns and the successful SMEs are always um, coming up above their competition in three ways. They got lower costs, they got higher quality, and they got shorter and accurate due dates. There's other competitive advantages, but, but factories that are growing typically share these three dimensions. So what's the in our toolbox for productivity? So we've got lean, Toyota production, continuous improvement, ERP which and digital, which Steve talked about, OEE, and things like IoT and Industry 4.0. So there's, there's a lot of ways we can take a run at this problem. And what is the problem? So according to Industry Week, the average machine on the shop floor is operating for 29% of a shift. Um, Steve talked about the productivity difference between us and the US. And these numbers, even on bottleneck equipment, people are shocked when we actually start looking at how many hours a shift are these machines actually functioning. And so for productivity, we've got two sides of the same coin, uptime and downtime. And the problem is we don't have um, visibility into what's causing our downtime. And a small decrease in downtime, if we go from 70% to 60%, that's actually a 33% increase in productivity. That kind of productivity increase just wipes out many cost advantages of products that, that are currently manufactured in Asia or we're importing from the US. So a whole spectrum of products become actually more competitive in Canada if we can get that productivity number managed. And where do we get it from? So we're not gonna find it in QuickBooks or ERP, payroll, costing, like there's really no solid mechanism to get uptime data. And I'll just go through one specific case just to give everyone, the participants, a uh, detailed look at, at how IoT can help you. So. Downtime, we've, we've got something like this floating around. We've got a work order for quantity of 10. It's going through two operations, CNC and welding. We've got some setup and runtime. So we're targeting 21 hours. This job gets done. Someone hand writes your actual time on here and sends it back to the front office. What's missing when we see these times is the story, like what actually happened here. And if you're like most small businesses, it's just a relief to have the job done. It's shipped and you're on to the next fire to, to, to put out and this gets filed somewhere. But if we drill down on this, what, how can IoT help us with, with the story? So if we put an $80 sensor on that equipment and start measuring power consumption, we're going to get this kind of data. So on the left, I've got the amps. Here's the 26 hours the job ran on our CNC machine. So it, it went across three and a half shifts. And this is what happened to our power profile. And this is just an amazing thing that IoT can provide because now we, we got the real story of, of what happened here in detail. So first off, we know there's a work order was for 10. But by measuring the power cycles, we can see we actually did 13 parts here. And we had a standard hours and we ended up above that at, at 26. And what happened here? So we got this gap. So we ran out of parts. Parts were supposed to arrive, they didn't show up. We've already got an hour set up into this, into this job, so we're not gonna tear it down. The parts eventually show up and we reconvene production. So. The whole North American economy runs on where's my parts. And that's, if you sit in any meeting on any manufacturing company in North America, that's like topic one. So this is a common scenario. We start with part six and we can see what happened here. Our, our power consumption went up and it kept climbing 
And then something really weird happened on part number nine. And actually what happened was the, the tool broke. And we scrapped seven, eight, nine because of the, the tool was, was not machining the parts properly. We had to get a new tool, get maintenance, throw back in. We lost some more downtime. We had to remake the parts and we, got, and we finally ended up completing this. So this $80 sensor now gives us the capability to look in detail of what's going on and spot improvement opportunities. Great for CI teams and lean manufacturing because now we have the real story that we can, we can trigger our initiatives on. We can start to Pareto our downtime. So what's the big reasons? What should the CI teams be working on? And this is all this data is coming out of this, this $80 sensor. MTech has, has made an application, you know, you can build it yourself. It's not that complicated, but we, we've kind of worked with our members. It's a, it's a member driven committee to, to work on, on their requirements runs on a mobile device and it's a check clock, chess clock metaphor. So when I stop, my downtime starts counting. And when I start my uptime clock starts counting. So just that mental conveyance to the operator that it's not a great thing when you hit the down button, you're looking at five to 10% productivity improvement just because we're starting to measure things. This is a super easy thing to, to get running, very little training. If I click my down, then I've got, I can select my down codes and I'm starting to track things for my Pareto. If I want more information, we can create dashboards and, and you can actually put a monitor up on the equipment to look at where we are on uptime, what's our goal, um, safety, our Pareto, and some other information here. So, this is what IoT starts to uh, enable on the shop floor. We can look at trends. So what happened today, what happened last 7, 30, and 12 months. So this is really concrete measurement for your continuous improvement teams to see like what is the actual impact are, are they having on, on the value of the value add capabilities of, of a machine we would typically start with bottleneck work centers, but this data is useful on just about any, any uh, piece of equipment. So you can apply this to all kinds of existing equipment. You don't have to buy it and replace it, but rotating equipment, you know, reciprocating equipment, stamps, punching, injection moldings, print, CNC, temperature control processes, material handling, Anything that consumes power or other things you wanna measure, you can apply IoT and start getting really good data from. The good news uh, in terms of adoption is uh, we have funding program available. So uh, MTech has partnered with ICTC and Mohawk to provide trained co-op students. And ICTC will fund 50 to 75% of co-op students wages for this program. So, that's available. If you want to um, either contact LEDC or uh, send an email to info at MTech Hub, we can send you more information on the program. Right now we have, uh, we have funding for 10 companies and actually just opened this week for a, the September to December co-op term. So that is just a super quick nutshell onto some easy ways that you can put IoT on the shop floor, the benefits you get out of it, how you tie the data coming from IoT into your lean and continuous improvement teams. And it's not a major enterprise-wide project like ERP or other um, major initiatives that are you know, six-figure plus type investments and, and six to 12 months implementation. Um, this quick start program, you're, up and, you're actually up and running on day one. We, we've, we've put this on equipment in less than an hour before. So um, that is sort of a little bit about MTech Hub, how you use IoT. And um, if there's any questions, we'd be happy to, to uh, take any questions. Thanks, Mark. That was a great overview on efficiencies and uh, what is the valuable information of uh, measure improvement. 
Uh, here's a few questions that we receive um, that MTech can help manufacturers. Uh, does a manufacturer have to be a member to use the MT Hub services? So of course we'd love to have new members and we think we have a good value proposition there, but this whole program applies to any manufacturer in Canada with more than 15 employees. So that's the only requirement to participate. Very easy. Uh, what is the average cost of uh, use your services? So the, uh, I'd have to get into a little more detail, but you're looking at a, you know, as low as a hundred dollars per equipment. If we're just measuring uh, current consumption uh, and then that's, that's the sensor cost. Everything else is, is being provided as part of the program. If you want additional sensors, so if you want to start measuring things like airflow in your compressed air system or pressure, it basically depends on what you want to measure and, and that um, drives the sensor cost. Okay. How do you measure success uh, at your services of products that you will provide? So, you know, we're, we're looking, f the whole point of this program is, is is to apply to any manufacturing company in any sector. So if you're, re you know, if you're labor intensive or you're a process industry, you're in food, electronics, everyone can benefit by measuring the same thing uh, that, we're, that we're doing here. So it's, it's widely applicable. In terms of like our experience putting in, you know, one of the, the success is the culture. This is really impacts the culture of the organization. So the wrong way to do this is to start getting this detail, data and beating up shop floor operators because they're not hitting standards. So that's not what this is about. What this is about is giving data to your continuous improvement team and say, okay, guys, like, look what happened here. We broke a tool. We lost three hours. Who's got, you know, better ideas on how we can avoid this in the future? And what can we start doing? So the, the, the spark of continuous improvement that that's going to happen when we go away, when the co-op student leaves, that, that we leave behind that, that, um, that bent for always getting better and doing better next month is, is really how we measure success. And the last one, that's uh, something related, Mark. It's, uh, and I says, uh, a live example. Um, a company that uh, actually have a packaging line uh, of candies and uh, sweets and all that. <clears throat> and at some point, uh, one of the machines uh, got stopped because uh, of the roller or the plastic uh, was coming in. Uh, it was an imported one. And uh, they have to stop like two or three times during the whole shift, uh, uh, that eight hour shift that they were packaging. Is there any way you can measure that as well on the programs that you mentioned that it was this 29 of my average machine operates uh, just on that? And if there is your program can benefit from that, that uh, they can measure how many times that a specific machine stops during that specific shift? So the, the general strategy is as follows. If you, if you look at the the maintenance guide or troubleshooting guide for equipment, it gives you clues on what you want, where you want to put sensors. So if you look at a packaging line on candies, um, if you've got things coming in on rolls, so now we want to measure roll speed. Um, we want to measure breaks in rolls, so that potentially could be a proximity sensor. Uh, if there is a reciprocating, like a filling function in there, we could put something to measure, you know, how many fills per hour we're getting. If there's volume or weight measurements, we can put sensors in there. And really you're just trying to look for abnormalities uh, in the process. So increased power consumption, increase or decrease pressure um, that you can reverse engineer that gives you a prediction that, hey, this is out of bounds of your normal tolerance and somebody needs to be looking at, at this. Just by measuring the power consumption and stops, you're at least gonna get data for your CI teams to see, okay, how many hours per shift is the packaging machine actually running? And what is the root cause when I have a break? 
And just on that information alone, you should be able to, to come up with, with game plans to make it better. That's perfect. Uh, so that's uh, all I have from you, uh, Mark, right now. Uh, Rafael, basically right now, uh, I don't have any more questions uh, for any, both of you. Uh, I just wanna just thank you both of you for all the time and uh, that's all the questions that we have. I hand it up to Jack, please. Great, <clears throat> great. thanks very much guys, uh, Stephen and Mark for uh, some great information. Um, before we do wrap up, I do wanna introduce my friend and colleague, Jason Bates who's on the Zoom with us. Uh, Jason wears a few different hats here in London. Um, Jason, for those who, are, who might have joined us or who will see these, uh, this webinar, could you explain your role at LRMC, the London Region Manufacturing Council, as well as your role at Excellence in Manufacturing Consortium here in the London region? And finally, uh, your connection to local tech and manufacturing companies as it relates to the company you co-founded, Factory Bucket, and some of the other uh, Industry 4.0 companies available locally. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Yeah, as Jack mentioned, I, I do a few things. I've been knocking around the sector in southwestern Ontario for over 20 years and, and work very closely with my friends at LEDC. They do a great job. So the London Region Manufacturing Council is a, um, it's an industry, um, industry managed um, council that advocates and, and, and promotes uh, prosperity and growth in the manufacturing sector in London. We do a lot of work on a municipal level. We get together with plants and, you know, uh, senior managers and work um, and work on issues that, that are relevant uh, municipally in and around London uh, for manufacturers. EMC is, is uh, Stephen mentioned, uh, consortium groups is a consortium group and I manage London and southwestern Ontario and basically what that is as I facilitate best practice sharing and, and benchmarking between manufacturers. And, and we work with probably about close to 200 manufacturers in London for that and about 500 across Southwestern Ontario. And for sure tech's been a big part of that best practice sharing and benchmarking over the past few years from industry 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. So we have a very active manufacturing sector in and around London sharing best practices and benchmarking through London Region Manufacturing Council, through LRMC and through LEDC. We all work together very well. Um, I think, you know, uh, great information presented today. Um, we're very fortunate in and around London to have a very active tech ecosystem within the manufacturing sector. We have a number of tech companies that have been working with manufacturers on all the things Mark talked about and Stephen talked about probably for the past, you know, eight to 10 years. We have some great machine monitoring companies. We talk about uptime, downtime companies like 10 and 6, companies like Freepoint. Um, we have great companies like uh, Factory Bucket that can help, you know, digitize and, and take that sort of thing. I think, you know, what we're seeing and what a lot of companies are now, manufacturers are now looking into is um, certainly getting all their systems to to connect and talk to each other. Like like Stephen mentioned, um, first step is is digitization, especially in a lot of SMEs. So you know, get those paper forms digitized. Uh, and off you go. We also have, I got to mention Fanshawe. We have some great support from Fanshawe, which I'm pretty sure all these programs that Mark talked about could be run through through them with the co-op students and everything like that. So we work closely with Fanshawe and, and stuff like that. And as the first step, paper processes uh, uh, are an easy first step. I think, you know, a lot of the, the past older ERP systems in tech um, were antiquated and, 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 you know, especially now that, you know, 20 years ago, th those sorts of software just assumed every manufacturing plant did the same thing. Yeah, they might have made the same thing or made something similar, but everybody's processes were different. So I think, you know, you're starting to see now um, software and tech out there that um, adapts to a plant's process rather than you having to adapt to the to the software and, and that's what manufacturers need. So, you know, they talked about change management too. And, you know, that's just like lean 20 years ago, everybody would do pushback when lean was getting implemented. But if you engage the workforce off, you go, you know, it'll, you'll get there. Uh, you know, we're seeing some stuff in the low code, no code um, kind of ideas and concepts of tech. Uh, the idea that, you know, you can empower your, your, your production planner or, Excel wizard to now actually make software that connects all your different platforms in house after little training. So we're seeing a lot, a lot of neat things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, great information and, and, 
And uh, we do have some great local resources, great local infrastructure in place here in and around London um, to help any manufacturers with, with this journey. They've been around for a while. They got some great experience. And like, like Mark mentioned and Stephen mentioned, it doesn't have to be a, a huge immense cost. The, the baby steps, the initial steps can be quite economical and show some great payback very quickly. Thanks for letting me sit in today, guys. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Jason. Uh, that's all the time we have today. Uh, for all the folks who have joined us uh, live, this, uh, the presentations and the information will be shared with you by email by LEDC tomorrow. Uh, for folks who are getting this later or for the folks who joined us live, if you, if you want to contact me or Jason directly to speak with any of our guests today, we can facilitate those introductions. So I just want to take the time to thank you guys all for joining us and uh, to reach out if you have any, any questions, we're here to help. Uh, so thanks, thanks everybody. Really appreciate your time today.